Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Ashley Parks, and I'm here to share a little bit today regarding hospitals and the administration, the financial, the challenges that we face financially and operationally in, in hospital environments. Uh, if you have any questions following this lecture, please feel free to reach out to me. The PowerPoint itself is posted in our course, uh, but I realize that this is a really nuanced and complex issue, and depending on the order in which you watch some of these lectures, and in which you explore some of this content, you may have different questions. So please seek me out so we can talk through some of those things together. To get us started, uh, I've, I've included a little TikTok here. Uh, I, I think this is, it's, it's unfortunate, our, our uh, financial and operational reality in, in hospitals, but this should at least give you a chance to laugh and joke a little bit about what that looks like. So take a look at that in the PowerPoint file. Hey man, how's it going? Well, I was supposed to do surgery today, but apparently I'm out of networks. The patient had to cancel. Out of here, get the gist. Probably the idea of a surgery being canceled because the patient's out of network, but that really has nothing to do with the patient's need for that surgery. Um, and it talks a little bit about health insurance companies driving a lot of hospital care. Just a quick note: uh, there's a ton of vocabulary in Chapter Eight of our textbook. The italicized words in the text are the ones you want to really dig into and pay attention to. Do not let yourself get stressed or overwhelmed trying to process everything in the textbook. Focus on those key terms, focus on the content provided in the lectures, and allow yourself to read and explore the content through the assignments. I will uh, be, be sharing lectures, be meeting with you Wednesday evenings to really reinforce key, key concepts. So I realize there's a lot to know, but focus in this case on those italicized words. So when we think about the history of hospitals, we have to understand how hospitals came to be, especially in the United States. Why do we have a history of hospitals serving specifically people living in poverty? And so when we look back to the 1800s, this was really care for those who were medically indigent, who didn't have other resources and options. Individuals who did received more of a concierge medicine type experience, again, this is historical, so right, this, it's not perfect, but ideally, if you were a person of means, you would have a physician come visit you in your home. You would be sick with tuberculosis or whatever ailment you had at home in your own bed. Hospitals became a place of refuge, a place where individuals could go if they needed care and did not have other means to have a physician visit them. Now, at what point did that change? When hospitals started offering technology, when we think about operating rooms, right, in the mid 1800s, right, Civil War era, seeing more and more operations, more and more understanding of antiseptic and sanitation and the sanitization of medical instruments. Also, diagnostic technology like imaging, when that comes really to the forefront in the 1900s, we need to go to a hospital for services for sophisticated care. So it became the preferred location for acute care versus the place that someone would go if they couldn't have a, a direct visit in their home. So a lot of hospitals were built in the early 1900s. We had advances in medicine and then all of a sudden demand for those inpatient services because they did offer a type of care that someone could not easily or reasonably receive at home. They were also profitable investments given that some people could pay for care, right? So there was money to be made. That business element became a component. Also with managed care, um, with Blue Cross and Blue Shield emerging as our first health insurance companies, all of a sudden there was funding um, available. Now we also have to think about why at the end of the 19, uh, of the 1900s, in the 1990s, why all of a sudden did hospitals start to downsize? With the advent of managed care and health insurance, there became more restrictions, right? Fewer days of stay would be approved in the hospital. Um, hospital stays had to be approved for medical necessity, and there became more efforts to reduce cost. With the advent of the diagnosis-related grouping, the DRG codes that Medicare uses for inpatient stays, those, came, those were developed and implemented in 1984. After that happened, hospitals no longer received cost-based or cost-plus reimbursement. They didn't get paid 
an amount based on how much they spent. Instead, they got paid based on the diagnosis and an amount of money that was predetermined. We call that prospective payment system or PPS, an amount of money that was predetermined for that type of diagnosis and that type of inpatient care. So all of a sudden, it wasn't quite as lucrative, if you will. Uh, also, the competitive environment, right? We've been seeing hospitals and health systems consolidating, right? The corporatization of medicine because of the need to survive and the need to pool our bargaining power to negotiate with health insurance companies. If you're a large system, you can get better pricing than an independent community hospital. So I've given you kind of a high level view, but when we think about the trends from the 1940s through the 2000s, this really helps explain changes in our national health system, um, our health services system, as well as insurance itself. In 1940s, we saw wage freezes, right? Times were tight, money was tight. And so employers started offering health insurance as a cheaper alternative to paying more. Isn't that funny? We wouldn't think about that now, right? With how expensive employment-based health insurance is. In the 1950s, we had lots of technology advances, including the first organ transplant. In the 1960s, we had, had something called the Hill-Burton Act, which provided funding to expand and modernize a lot of hospital facilities. And also in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid were enacted. So we had care uh, through Medicare for the aged, over 65 and disabled, and Medicaid for, the, uh, for individuals below a certain percentage of the federal poverty line. In the 1970s, specifically 1974, the HMO Act is passed. In response to huge increases in national health expenditures, they decide to allow for HMOs to more closely control care. In the 1980s, I just talked about this earlier, the diagnosis-related groupings model, the idea that hospitals need to be efficient because they only get a set amount per a patient, per, depending on diagnosis, began to be instituted. And again, that's 1984. In the 1990s, we see managed care, HMO, PPOs, that model of tightly controlling utilization, um, requiring prior authorization grows and hospitals shrink a little, right? They right size. And then in 2000s, we see widespread consolidation as hospitals and health systems work to try to pool their power and their bargaining power in order to work with insurance companies. And you can see during this time, expenses are going up, up, up from a national health expenditure perspective. So what is a hospital, right? We often think about inpatient or acute care. Many hospitals also provide outpatient services, clinic services, outpatient radiology or lab services. Most hospitals receive the majority of their funding through government payers, Medicare and Medicaid combined, right? And a large portion of their funding also comes from private insurances with a small portion coming from cash pay or self-pay patients. Different hospitals may choose or not choose to specialize. There are specialty hospitals in the United States that only do certain things or that only take certain types of insurance. Uh, but if you have an emergency department, you are required um, to have CMS deemed status, meaning you see Medicare, Medicaid patients, and provide a certain amount of charity care, right? Openness to providing care for the underserved. With inpatient services, hospitals are required to have at least six beds. They're licensed by the state, in this case, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. They have a medical staff, which is the physician group, physicians that have privileges to practice at the hospital. Generally, they're not employed by the hospital. There's different roles about that by state but they are on the hospital's medical staff. So they practice, see patients and bill those patients directly for those services. We have a board and CEO. The CEO reports to the hospital board. And of course we have support services, things like parking and food and the gift shop and really vital things like pharmacy, right? For, for medications. Not all hospitals emphasize outpatient services, it's not required, but many have outpatient service offerings as a way to provide services to the community, generate referrals, and be engaged. There's a growing set of different types of services performed. And there's a lot of services that used to require inpatient hospital care that now can be done outpatient. For example, a gallbladder removal. There's smaller incisions, quicker surgeries, laparoscopic surgeries that can be done without large incisions. Um, for a quicker recovery time. That's better for everybody. 
When we think about funding models, there are three basic types of hospitals as far as how they're funded. The first one is not-for-profit. So this would be your typical local community hospital that is not working to generate income to pay shareholders. They're not privately owned. They don't have stock that they sell. They are community benefit, not for profit. That's a little bit different from for-profit hospitals. For-profit hospitals can be privately owned by an individual or a group of individuals or publicly traded. For example, HCA or Healthcare Corporation of America is one of the largest health systems in the United States and they are publicly traded. You can buy stock in HCA Healthcare. They're a for-profit healthcare entity. And then of course we have local government. Some of these are county hospitals that are ran by local government. And then we, of course, we have federal government hospitals like the VA health system, the Indian Health Service. Uh, we also have to think about the different factors that, that affect hospital operations. The size of the hospital, the services offered, how much capital funding investments required in order for them to do what they do. And how does that translate to patient experience and patient satisfaction? So we've got hospital classifications. A lot of times when we talk about hospitals, we're talking about a general acute care hospital. What your text refers to as a general medical surgical hospital. But there are specialty hospitals, there are psychiatric hospitals that provide purely mental health services. There are rehabilitation hospitals. For example, there are inpatient rehabilitation uh, facilities or ERFs that provide care for a short term, a week or two or three, after someone has a knee replacement surgery, a hip replacement, a stroke, maybe a traumatic brain injury. And then, the, and then there are also long-term rehabilitation centers and skilled nursing facilities that provide long-term opportunities for individuals to be receiving rehab services and, and assistance with their uh, activities of daily living, their ADLs. We also have other specialties, children's hospitals, cancer hospitals, orthopedic hospitals. I used to work with, a, with an orthopedic hospital where um, it, it, they, they performed orthopedic surgeries and then they also had a rehab unit for people to recover afterwards. We have cardiac or heart hospitals and of course, women's health. Um, so uh, when you think about birthing centers, for example. Now, we often also classify hospitals by the intensity of service. Is this a rural hospital? Is it in a rural area? Is it a critical access hospital? That's a very small hospital that has no more than 25 beds, an average length of stay uh, that's less than four days. So it's just instant need, maybe a hospital up in the mountains that you know the patient gets helicoptered to, they take care of them. Uh, but it really is about that instant service for that rural population or that population who can't get to services elsewhere. Critical access hospitals do tend to have different reimbursement methods, ways to keep them in business and alive. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in our finance section. Community hospitals or non-rural community hospitals are general comprehensive services, right? So when we think about general acute care services, I have surgery, I'm in the hospital for three days, I'm in a heart attack, I'm in the hospital. And then we have teaching hospitals, um, often referred to as academic medical centers, normally affiliated with the School of Medicine, uh, or at least they have residents coming in from a School of Medicine, and they tend to provide very specific, very acute, uh, severe type care. So facilities, of course, we said earlier, are licensed by the state. So we have the um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services licensing hospitals here. You also have to think about the certificate of need element. And my husband and I, um, I think I've shared my husband as a chief financial officer for a health system. Him and I recently worked on a paper about the validity and appropriateness of certificate of need. Certificate of need is actually the idea that hospitals, in order to build or do any major investment, build a new site, they have to get state approval and show that there's a local need. And when they go through that process, their competitors can actually lobby against them to develop new services. It's designed to prevent too much competition and unnecessary services, but it can also hamper access a little bit. That's my perspective, as I wrote about the paper. Uh, certification, so in addition to licensing, hospitals can be certified. For example, a rehab hospital can receive something called CARF certification. 
that's the acute care rehab certification. Uh, many hospitals can receive what we call DSC certification, disease specific certification. They can be a stroke center or a cardiac rehab center, a specific certification for a specific grouping of services. And then we have to think about who provides accreditation. Licensing is from the state, you're licensed to be in business. Certification, again, is for uh, specialization of certain types of treatment. You can be recognized to do that. Accreditation normally occurs to the Joint Commission, um, but other agencies can accredit you. There are four, um, including DNV, NCIHQ, different organizations with different acronyms. Uh, DNV, actually, I can't explain that acronym because it is uh, a foreign word. If they're not domestic to the United States, they're uh, from Europe. And CIHQ is a Center for Improvement in Healthcare Quality. Those groups, in addition to the Joint Commission, can be contracted by hospitals to accredit them. All hospitals that treat Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance patients must be accredited. So that is a process where the Joint Commission comes in. They normally perform what's called a triennial or once every three year survey and make sure that you're doing everything you need to do. Joint Commission used to be called JCO, Joint Commission for Accreditation of Hospital Organizations. Now it's just the Joint Commission. Some people call them Joint Commission. Some people call them TJC. But their goal is to continuously improve the safety and quality of care. Um, and they partner with, and a lot of other organizations engage in this, including the American College of Surgeons, Physicians, the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, all support this process of accreditation. They come in for that triennial on-site every three-year survey, and they look at everything you do, how you provide care, how you reduce the likelihood of infections, what your documentation looks like. And they have a list of standards that they go through called the Joint Commission Standards. And they look at those in addition to something called CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CLPs, Conditions of Participation. So in order to participate and treat those Medicare, Medicaid patients, you have to meet the conditions of participation, and you also have to meet the Joint Commission standards. Now, they can offer lots of different levels of accreditation, ranging from full accreditation, everything's fine, provisional, if you're new, they'll give you provisional accreditation and come back and check on how things are going if it's a new hospital site. Conditional accreditation, if they have some concerns and they are asking you to fix them, they may give you conditional accreditation based on that you can be accredited if you fix certain things. If those concerns are broader, they may preliminarily deny you accreditation and you have to contest that and prove that those aren't an issue. You can receive a full denial of accreditation. And that's really unfortunate uh, because with full denial of accreditation, uh, it's, it's very difficult to come back from that, right? Can't really stay open. And then there's preliminary accreditation. So just like provisional, right? Provisional is normally for a new site, a new service line, a new location. Preliminary is for those completely new organizations who really have yet to establish processes. So we've got a lot of different measures that we look at for hospital performance. How long you're in the hospital, your average length of stay, how many days of care are being provided, how many discharges it gives us an idea of volume. What's your capacity? How many beds do you have? How many patients can you see? And what is your ADC or average daily census? How many patients are in the hospital on average in a day? And that divided by your patient beds gives us your occupancy rate. So we look at all of this to see how full you are, how efficient, how busy you are. And then when we really think about clinical performance, when we really think about patient experience, we look at other metrics. And these are all tracked and shared on this website called Hospital Compare. Um, so you might want to check that out. Uh, one of those metrics is something called the HCAP survey, the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers. There's lots of different assessments of healthcare providers. The H in front means, that the ho means it's the hospital survey, but this survey is also given to health plans and outpatient centers. They also have their version of CAPS, but HCAPS is the hospital version. So that is a survey that goes out to Medicare and Medicaid members to see what their experience in the hospital is like. Then we have timeliness of care, right? What is your experience with, you know, are you waiting 30 minutes? Are you waiting eight hours in the ED? Complications, right? 
How many of your patients are getting post-op infections, right? Having post-op metabolic derangement or other problems, um, blood sugar regulation. Um, and then we look at 30 days from the discharge. Did the patient pass away? Did the patient come back to the hospital? Now, there's a lot of other elements that are part of patient satisfaction. How well does the nurse communicate? How well does the physician communicate? The HCAP survey even asks about the cleanliness of the facility, how quiet it is. Can you sleep? Is it quiet enough? They, they ask about medication and communication about medication. And would you recommend the hospital? And those are just a few, but those are the broad patient satisfaction categories. Next, we have the timeliness of care elements, right? So we look at how long you're waiting. And there's several measures that fit under this. Things like waiting in emergency department with stroke symptoms, you should receive a scan within 45 minutes of arrival so that you can get TPN or whatever's the appropriate medication right away. So there's specific metrics for certain diagnoses, such as if you have a heart attack and you need medication right away to break up those blood clots, you should be getting that within 30 minutes of getting to the hospital. Now, there are other things we look at. I, I alluded to this earlier, hospital acquired conditions, infections, things like central line associated bloodstream infections, call those clapsies. If you have a central line or an IV inserted, you get an infection. What about catheter associated urinary tract infections? Patients with catheters, do they get an infection? We also look at readmissions and mortality for very specific groups. If a patient comes in with a heart attack or what we refer to as an acute myocardial infarction or AMI, a heart attack is an AMI, um, are they discharged safely? Do they come back within 30 days? Do they pass away within 30 days? We also look at that for heart failure patients, pneumonia patients, certain types of surgeries. So this is just a snapshot. The list goes on, but I want you to get a broad idea of how hospitals are held accountable. Hospital organizations are complex. We know this. And it takes a lot of organizational awareness and deliberate processes and documentation for hospitals to function appropriately. And I want to show you an example of how complex that can be. This is a sample organizational chart, and this is for UNC hospitals. You'll notice we have the UNC board at the top, the board of directors for UNC Healthcare. We've got Roper right underneath the chief executive officer, Dr. Roper. And then we've got Gary Park, who's the president of UNC hospitals. Now, William Roper is also over a lot of other things, right? Strategic planning and work that's done in other areas and other settings versus just the hospital piece, right? There's more to healthcare. So that's why you see that splice off. Now, there's a lot of different vice presidents and, and CNO, that stands for chief nursing officer, a lot of different roles. These are just high, high level executive roles in their organization. But you can see how there's a lot of oversight and it's really important that there's that coordination in hospitals because of the, the many quality metrics we have to track and the changing financial and operational realities that we have to function in, in order to perform well. Well, I hope this was helpful just to have me talk through a few slides, give you a little a brief overview of hospitals. Uh, again, reach out as questions come up and, and we can talk through it one-on-one -on -one or join our live sessions Wednesday evenings and we can talk through it more. Thank you.